want to share with you a little bit is about what's happening in Venezuela uh, on the oil industry side and a little bit, of course, of, on the political <coughs> side because one and the other are absolutely interlinked. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, Be Venezuela uh, used to be the largest exporter of oil in the world, exporter, not producer, the U.S. and, and the Soviet Union produced more oil, but Venezuela until the late 60s was the largest exporter when Saudi Arabia surpassed uh, Venezuela. Um, and uh, production peaked initially uh, in the 19, uh, early 1970s, 1970-71, at about 3.6, 3.7 million barrels per day. Then it went uh, down uh, significantly um, um, because of the lack of investment that had happened because of the um, sort of, uh, you know, the, the expiration of the, of the concessions uh, and eventually the nationalization of the oil industry in 1976. Uh, but then it recovered in the 1990s. I, and by the way, in the 80s, also Venezuela did a lot of cutting uh, of production because it, OPEC was, you know, cutting production until 1986. But then afterwards, there was a recovery, and a significant part of the recovery happened because private companies came back to the country. Um, uh, all the major, you know, IOCs, uh, to give you one, one example, of course, uh, you know, Exxon, Chevron, Total, uh, BP, Shell. But to give you one, one uh, very dramatic example, Conoco had 10% of their world oil reserves in, in Venezuela on, until they were nationalized uh, and, and sort of decided to not accept the forced contract renegotiation that President Hugo Chavez uh, sort of, you know, imposed uh, on them. And Exxon also, also left. But many of the other IOCs stayed in Venezuela as minority shareholders in uh, uh, joint ventures controlled by the National Company of Venezuela, uh, PDVSA. On the political front, you know, Venezuela, after being a very prosperous uh, democracy, uh, you know, uh, when the Collapsing the price of oil happened in the 1980s. The economy started to tank, um, and Venezuela had a very bad economic performance. And that led to eventually, you know, an attempted coup by a uh, lieutenant colonel that eventually uh, became president elected, uh, Hugo Chavez, and turned the country into a very uh, leftward and authoritarian uh, direction. And in particular, had a lot of impact over the oil industry because he fired almost half of the employees of the national oil company that uh, uh, during a strike because of the, his attempt to, you know, to uh, uh, not only fully control the economy, but in particular take over the, the autonomy of the, of the national uh, oil company. And, it, you know, to understand the effects of that, it's important to notice two things. First, that the private companies that came into Venezuela added about 1.1 million barrels of capacity of per day, of production capacity per day. Uh, and Hugo Chavez benefited from that because <coughs> those investments were ongoing when he uh, was elected. The national company, on the other hand, started going downhill ever, ever since this uh, oil strike that I, that I mentioned and the firing of 20,000 of 20, employees. But we didn't notice that much because the production on the private side was going up. And the government <coughs> took over those projects, those private projects, after they had already deployed all their investments, right? And the other thing is that the price of oil skyrocketed in 2003. And so the revenues to the government actually increased dramatically, even though production was slowly going down. By the time that uh, Hugo Chavez died in 2013, uh, production had declined from about 3.4 million barrels uh, before Chavez to about 2.7 uh, when Nicolas Maduro came into power, which is you know, the current president uh, appointed by, by, by Chavez and elected in conditions that were considered uh, you know, fraudulent, but still the, you know, the international community uh, uh, recognized him at the time. Eventually, you know, he the country became more and more authoritarian the price of oil collapsed in 2014. The way they were running the country, just one example, during 2012, peak uh, price of oil, average price of oil in, in history. Venezuela, because it was an election year and Chavez wanted to win the elections, even though he uh, abused, you know, in, in many ways the electoral system, he spent 18% of GDP of deficit 
a deficit that you will not see almost, you know, as an economist. I only have seen this in, in massive financial crisis in countries that are, you know, in collapse. This guy spent like this when he had the highest income ever. No? And so that type of policy led to then the collapse, right, of the country. And the country uh, started to collapse in, 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 in 2013 already, before the price of oil collapsed. By, the, by that time already, the national company owed tons of money to its partners, to uh, its uh, suppliers, to contractors, and, and the, the company had increased its uh, uh, financial debt from $3 billion to about uh, 40. No, so the situation was already dire, and it ma was made worse by the decline in the price of oil. And then, so production started declining very fast. And to give you an idea, by the time the, the U.S. imposed sanctions to Venezuela in 2019, uh, oil sanctions, uh, meaning that they didn't, the U.S. didn't allow companies to uh, import oil to the U.S. from Venezuela or export. Uh, uh, oil products to Venezuela. Um, by that time, production in the year before that, production was on average 1.5 million barrels, so it had declined from about 2.7 to 1.5. Um, but the production in the last month before the sanctions was about 1.3. So we, uh, production was half uh, uh, before U.S. sanctions. I think this is important because occasionally you hear that U.S. sanctions are responsible for the collapse of the Venezuelan oil industry. And, and that's simply not the case. No? The, moreover, if you look at the, uh, what was expected from Venezuela, Venezuela should have been producing by 2014 around 5 million barrels or, or more. And it was, as I mentioned, producing uh, 2.7. The, the reason, because of the policies uh, uh, that the government had implemented, not only the firing of, of the employees, of the best technical employees, by the way, some are sitting here right now, <laughs> But, um, but because they nationalized the industry and took over the majority of, uh, of the shares in, in, in joint ventures. So keep in mind, 1.3 million barrels, the US sanctions Venezuela, half a million barrels, that, uh, a little bit more than half a million barrels that were exported from Venezuela to the US, all of a sudden do not have that market and have to search for another market. And about 150,000 barrels of imported products and diluents for the, uh, the, uh, either for the Venezuelan domestic market or to dilute, because Venezuela has a very extra heavy oil, very uh, heavy oil, so they need to blend it with a, either a, a, a very light oil or condensate or a, a product or a refined product in order to be you know, able to not only transport it but also to, to, to sell it in the, in the market, right? And so uh, CITGO, by that time, by the way, CITGO is owned by by PDVSA, by the National Company of Venezuela, CICO was a significant buyer of Venezuelan oil and exporter of products to, uh, to Venezuela. So in, in 2019, the, these sanctions are imposed. And on top of that, the government of Donald Trump uh, uh, doesn't recognize Nicolás Maduro as the president anymore, but the president of the National Assembly, because the Venezuelan Constitution says that if there is no president when the term uh, uh, starts, and not a new president-elect, then the president of the National uh, Assem Assembly becomes the interim president. But of course, Maduro was elected in fraudulent elections, but of course he controlled power, so he, he wouldn't uh, allow that to happen. Uh, and so since then, uh, the, the confrontation with the US was very significant, and the Venezuelan National Assembly that was used to be controlled by the opposition uh, took over the assets uh, that uh, PDVSA had in the US, in particular, CITGO. And to, the, to this day, that's the, the situation that the, you know, the former National Assembly of Venezuela appointed the, the management of, the, of, the, of, of CITGO, and that's another story if you want, we can talk about in the questions about that. But then in 2020, the Trump administration decided to pressure even further uh, the Venezuelan uh, regime and impose uh, secondary sanctions, because in the meantime, Venezuela gave Rofneft, the national oil company of, of Russia, uh, 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 basically control over most of the marketing of Venezuela's oil, and they were importing the diluents. But the U.S. then sanctioned roughness trading, the company that was doing this, and that resulted in, um, uh, in, in roughness basically stopping do, doing any, any marketing of Venezuelan oil. And on top of that, that was combined with Chevron, the only company 
that was seriously investing in Venezuela at the time, the U.S. removed their license to invest in Venezuela and basically told them to either wind down or just remain like, you know, as, as, as they were but not, you know, do any investment. And so those two things happened at the same time as COVID hit uh, the world. And so the collapse of the price of oil led to Venezuelan uh, heavy oil uh, being sold at like, like $5 per barrel. And as you would imagine, all that was a tsunami that led Venezuelan oil production to 350,000 barrels by the mid of 2020. Uh, so imagine, this is like a 10% of what Venezuela produced before Chavez, right? A an astonished decline. Uh, you had to go to the 1930s to uh, go to that level of production in, in, in the country. Um, but as the price of oil recovered relatively fast after the, uh, the COVID, uh, 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 close down, uh, Venezuela started to be able to increase production because what they had done was basically uh, close production because they couldn't sell it. It wasn't that they were not able to produce, it was that they were not able to sell that oil. So there was some, let's call it spare capacity, there are different definitions of that, but you know, there was some room to increase production relatively quickly without major investments. And so the uh, production recovered basically because of the help of Iran. Iran now became the main partner of Venezuela in uh, 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 taking that oil through the black market. Basically, it ended up in independent refiners in China. The story is fascinating. It's, you know, there, there could be a book about it because you, 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 know, you have these ships that are called ghost ships. You know, these are ships that have a, a, a taken the identity of another ship that, that was supposed to you know, be uh, uh, already, uh, 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 you know, in uh, uh, scrap. Uh, they uh, did. The, they took the transponder off. They did transshipment of oil in the middle of the sea. Uh, they went to Malaysia and made it look as if it was Malaysian oil. All of a sudden, Malaysia started exporting much more oil than it produced to China, and all that meant that Venezuela had to give heavy discounts for for this black market. Uh, and that they had even trouble to get the mo their money back. Recently, we had a massive corruption scandal in Venezuela in which we realized that about 15% uh, 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 of their uh, account receivables were unaccounted for, uh, and the others, a lot of them had been, the only way to, to get their money back or something back was by barter of some products that nobody knew exactly where they were. No? So big, big, big uh, uh, problem. Uh, but the Iranians do, did make a good, uh, a good business of that with, with Venezuela, and they sent the, their condensates that they had a problem selling to Venezuela. So imagine what was happening. Condensates, which is a very light oil, came all the way from Iran to Venezuela, were blended with Venezuelan extra heavy oil, and then went all with this, all this crazy story that I mentioned to China. It couldn't be crazier in terms of the economics of doing uh, that. But that's what happened, right? And so production reached uh, a level of about 800,000 barrels by the end of uh, 2021, but then it stagnated because basically they had to invest in order to you know, increase the production even further. And no, uh, none of the international companies was willing to invest in those conditions. Imagine uh, you know, who how do you get paid? Uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you, and you, of course, don't want to get involved into that crazy situation that only PDVSA was involved with. Um, uh, and so production stagnated and started to slowly decline uh, around uh, between 20, uh, uh, during, during 2022. And then the US, uh, and then Ukraine happened, right? And the, the US that was already, the Biden administration was already thinking about changing policy because they felt that the Trump maximum pressure policy had not worked, they, they were given not only an excuse, but sort of a, a motivation to, to, you know, the White House uh, said, let's look at opportunities to get oil into the market, because, you know, uh, by the way, at the beginning of the crisis, remember, people thought that three million barrels of Russian oil will be out of the market. It never happened. Uh, it was much less, uh, but there was a lot of anguish uh, uh, about what could happen. And so, that led the, the Biden administration to send some representatives to Venezuela, Juan Gonzalez from the National Security Council, 
And unfortunately, that meant that Nicolás Maduro thought, oh, the Americans now need me, and I will be in a, in a great position. And, and you know, for a while, that created a lot of uh, sort of mismatch in the negotiations because Maduro felt, you know, uh, you know they, they really need me. Eventually, they, he realized that he had to negotiate something. And so eventually, they gave, uh, as part of these negotiations, uh, a license to Chevron. Chevron is the biggest player in Venezuela still. Uh, they are producing today about 140,000 barrels of oil. Um, of course, only a minor share is, is there, theirs, but they operate uh, that quantity. The, uh, the only two bigger pl big players, not smaller than Chevron at this point, but big players in Venezuela are the Chinese and the Russians. No other Western company is, is a significant player in the, in, on, the, on the oil side, although we, we will talk a little bit in a second about the Europeans. Um, and there is a major um, a player that is the uh, ENI and Repsol are very big players in natural gas, and we can talk about gas if you want later on. So that license was the first time that you know, a foreign company was going to invest in Venezuela since before uh, sanctions. And that led to an increase in production in the, in the four joint ventures that Chevron has, three of which are relevant, the other one is minimal. And, and so that started creating a flow of money to Venezuela. But notice that Chevron uh, was owed like uh, billions of dollars uh, because they, they weren't able to collect all, during all this time of sanctions. And so a lot of these exports are used to repay Chevron's debt. How much? We don't know exactly because it's the contract is secret. It was approved by OFAC. So it's known by Maduro, Chevron, and the Office of the Treasury. Nobody else knows the details. What we know is that Maduro had to give Chevron a very attractive deal that has never been the case in Venezuela since, since Chavez. Basically, Chevron controls operations, controls the cash flow, controls procurement. That, that no other partner does that. The Chinese a little bit, but nobody else. So what, is, what happened recently? So recently, the, the, the negotiations between the U.S. and the and Maduro administration continued. Uh, we know that it had, they happened in Qatar. <laughs> Don't ask me why so far, but that's where they, they did the negotiations. And the U.S. basically told Maduro the following. We can give you a suspension of oil sanctions for six months as long as you, as you accept a series of uh, uh, commitments to hold elections that are sort of competitive. <laughs> uh, but these are commitments in the future. Maduro doesn't have to give up anything today, except he, he freed some political prisoners. Uh, but he committed to, theoretically, uh, an election in the second semester of next year. You may ask, but why does he have to commit that? Isn't that supposedly you know, firm in the Constitution, like in the US? Well, it turns out that Maduro does whatever he wants when, with elections in Venezuela, even though the Constitution says that in January of 2025, a new president has, has to take uh, possession. Then uh, he committed to having international observers, in particular the Carter Center and the Euro Euro European Union. And he committed to theoretically uh, allow the opposition to run uh, any candidates. But he didn't commit formally to lift the ban on opposition candidates uh, to, to run. And that's the big sort of point of contention between the US and Maduro. Because the opposition had a primaries, uh, was it two weeks ago? Two, two, um, the 22nd of October. And uh, not only there was some very significant participation, 2.5 million uh, people uh, uh, in a situation in the country that nobody thought that that, could be, that that would be possible. Because you know that was self-organized in like homes of people, squares, in, and harassment by the government, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line, very significant participation. And 92% of the people voted for Maria Corina Machado, a candidate that has always been one of the most aggressive anti-Maduro uh, persons in, 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 the, in the Venezuelan opposition, and therefore that allowed her, her to be seen as not connected to the traditional parties that had been uh, you know, negotiating with Maduro in the past. So bottom line, that, that, that a deal in Barbados was signed, supposedly you know, agreeing with these things. The, the primaries were held, and then uh, the Maduro 
freed some prisoners, and the U.S. announced the lifting of, of sanctions for six months. But the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, said that if in November the United States didn't see action in terms of listing the ban to opposition candidates, and he didn't see, he didn't say the actual lifting of the ban, but at least a process started, which of course opens up to that, that the U.S. might claw back the, 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 this. Uh, and so let me uh, very quickly tell you what I think will happen in the oil industry because of this and what might happen politically. <laughs> and we open up to, to questions. Um, in terms of production, and you know, a lot of people speculate in the U.S. By the way, there has been a lot of not well-grounded uh, speculation about what the Venezuelan oil industry can contribute in the short term in terms of additional barrels of oil. You know, I heard crazy numbers, even coming from people who should know better. And of course, there, is a lot of, there are a lot of interests involved here, and I can understand that. But bottom line, uh, some people were talking about, you know, adding a million barrels in a matter of a year, that, that's not going to happen. In fact, what we expect to happen in the next year or so is very limited with respect to this license in particular on the production side. What we think is going to happen is basically that the barrels at Chevron, which has their own license separate from this, and that is going to continue no matter what, is my expectation at least, um, that Chevron will continue their investment program. They will end up producing at the end of this year about 150,000 barrels. They are starting for the first time a drilling program uh, uh, of new wells in, in Venezuela, a drilling campaign with two uh, oil rigs uh, starting in, in, in January. And so they might add another 50,000 barrels and, uh, you know, in 2024 and perhaps other 50 in, in, in 2025 if everything goes, you know, uh, uh, well. Outside of that, uh, we have four European companies that are in Venezuela that might do some investment, but I think are unlikely to do it unless they get a, a license and a contract similar to Chevron because otherwise it doesn't make sense to invest anything in Venezuela. Moreover, with a six-month horizon, with this general suspension of, it's not, a, you know, nobody's going to do anything if you have only a six-month horizon. They would like to know a little bit more about what's going to happen. But we know that Morel & Prom, which is a French company but owned by Pertamina, the, the national company of Indonesia, has for a similar contract than Chevron, and they might increase their production. They have a, a 10,000 barrel uh, project today it used to be a shell uh, operated project. Uh, 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 shell is in Venezuela today only in, in interested in gas, not, not anymore in, in oil. And then you have other three European companies, ENI, that has a, a, a shallow water uh, project that could increase significantly production. It's not producing almost anything today. And then you have Repsol which has two projects, uh, one in the Orinoco Belt and another conventional project that are producing relatively little today and that if they invest could produce more. The case of ENI and Repsol is more complex and interesting because they have a very large uh, offshore natural gas project that sells totally to the domestic market and the Venezuelan government doesn't pay them back except occasionally. And so these companies have to figure out a way to monetize. Now they have been allowed at least to export the liquids, about 10,000 barrels uh, of, of oil that come out of that project. But I do expect ENI to, um, to uh, uh, develop their, their, uh, their investments uh, uh, as soon as they get a, a contract similar to, to, to Chevron. Uh, we know that some American investors have gotten involved in that project. So I think knowing that these people are very savvy and knowledgeable, I, I think that's going to happen because otherwise they will not be putting money into that project. So we can see some in increase in production in these European companies. And by the way, there, there is also Perenco, which has a very small project. So to add, say, 60 to 80,000 barrels in the next two years. Uh, and, and that, I think, it's, opti it's actually optimistic because you know, all the uncertainties that these companies are facing during the electoral cycle, not only in Venezuela, but in the U.S. That is happening at the, sort of in the same year. Uh, so what is it then for Maduro if production is only going to increase and mostly from a license that was already there? Well, the big issue, and well, that's why Maduro was irresistible, I mean, this, this offer was irresistible for Maduro, is that he's now taking all the oil that he had to sell through the black market, 
with those uh, super difficult conditions that I mentioned before and at a heavy discount. And now they will s he will sell them in the US Gulf Coast at a full price. And uh, there are plenty of refineries that are interested in these uh, types of uh, Venezuelan uh, heavy grades. So that will dramatically increase uh, the flow of money to the Venezuelan uh, government. In a year, if all the oil is redirected to the US, they could be getting you know, um, as much as 80% more revenues than they are getting per month uh, uh, today, in, and, and in cash, no? Because today, a lot of it is in, in of course, that will take some time to happen, but it will, uh, it will happen relatively fast, the, the, the redirection of oil from China to uh, Venezuela. We don't know yet, if, for example, uh, today CNPC, the national company of China, announced that they want to buy 265,000 barrels of oil per day, given that now the US authorizes that. They were, they were not doing it. They, you know, all, everything was black market. So they, they, they announced that. I, I think to PDVSA, it's much more convenient to sell oil in the US than in China. But if the Chinese pay you know, full price, it might be attractive. Although the problem is that Venezuela owes China like more than $14 billion of, of uh, debt. And so the Chinese typically, when they get oil there, they use a part to, to collect the payments on the debt. So uh, it's unclear to me that they will be that interested in sending to China more than the 100,000 barrels that China actually produces in Venezuela. So I, I, I foresee a lot of movement to the, to the US market, at least for the next six months. And so Maduro, what he will get if the US stops everything in six months? He will get the billions of dollars additional that he will get because of this switch, plus a little bit of additional production and, and investments in the, in the meantime. But as I said, I don't think anyone will invest seriously unless they get their own specific uh, uh, license. How would the US benefit? Well, in the short run, you have the refiners here in the Gulf Coast benefiting from that uh, availability of, of Venezuelan crude, but it's not something that will significantly you know, improve the, the, the price of gasoline for consumers in the US or reduce the price of oil in internationally. Uh, it's more of a long-term sort of a strategic. I mean, if you think about the world today, it's very messy. You have you know, a, a war in Ukraine. You have a, a, a crisis in the Middle East. That puts at risk a lot of the oil production in the world. So the Western Hemisphere is, of course, an attractive place then to look at. And where, where in, the, in the Western Hemisphere can, you can increase production of oil? Well, you have Guyana and Brazil that are already increasing. And there's not much that you can do additional to get more investment there. And then you have a little bit of potential in Argentina, which is a country that I am half Argentinian, so I can joke about them. They are an absolute <laughs> mess, just surpassed by Venezuela. And, and then you have a, a Venezuela, which has this massive potential uh, that is, you know, a, a, a lot of it can, can be uh, recovered. So I think strategically, it's clear that the US wants Venezuela back in the oil market. But of course, the US also wants Venezuela not to become a, a full autocracy. And so that's what they have to sort of uh, a, a deal with and, and to negotiate. So I, I think we can open it to, to, to questions because uh, I, I'm happy to, to answer questions. And I know that some of the things that I didn't <coughs> cover will be probably covering the questions. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Moraldi. Ladies and gentlemen, usually you're here seeing Ronan O'Malley, our chief programs officer. Unfortunately, he's not here this evening. I will try to do my best to help this Q&A go by as smooth as possible. Um, Rinaldi, uh, just in the meantime, please pass up your questions. Um, I'm sure you have lots of uh, brighter questions than I might be able to pull off. But um, Dr. Rinaldi, let's see. First off, if we can go back towards the election um, um, and how that affects. Um, it was October 22nd, you said we had the, um, the, primary. the primary elections um, to determine the candidates for the elections and with uh, Maria Machado with a landslide victory. Um, knowing that the government um, actually banned all opposition forces, including her, Capriles, and everyone, um, let's see, from running next year, how do you think the oppos opposition is going to actually proceed going forward, and how can they play a role um, with the markets in the oil industry going forward? How can they play a role considering um, what they've been going through? Yeah, you know, the, the Venezuelan opposition has uh, a, di a very difficult uh, uh, situation because of, of, of the following. They, they know, I mean, Maduro was for a while in, in, in a difficult situation because 
you know, so many countries recognize the interim president and all that, but he survived. Not only he survived that, he survived a collapse of the Venezuelan economy of 80% of GDP. That is something that you have never seen in a country without a major war or, or, or civil war. So it, it, it's, it's astonishing that he has survived all, all that, right? So he feels now in, in very empowered. The only reason why he's negotiating anything is because the US dangled this massive carrot in front of him, right? And of course, he does think that the US has incentives themselves to give him the car without him giving a, a lot away. But he, you know, that's what he's sort of pondering, right? C how far can I get? Because this is a guy who is not going to give power, uh, you know, uh, 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 because he's uh, a nice guy. He, he has shown that he's willing to torture, murder, and uh, destroy the economy in order to survive in power. So it defies to me any, you know, uh, uh, rational thinking that the guy will allow free and fair elections. However, it's tricky for him because, you know, he claims to be a Democrat and he has to hold elections next year. Elections are always problematic for autocrats, you know. Most autocrats in the world do run elections, but elections are a crisis moment for them because the people mobilize and it's shown that they might not be that popular, right? During normal times, they can, it's easier to control the population. So now he has an even bigger problem. He has a, a, a one leader of the Venezuelan opposition that got 92% of the vote and that has shown the capacity to mobilize the population. That's an, an even bigger headache. To give you an idea, just a, a year and a half ago, I, I, my, my sources that are close to the Venezuelan government told me that they actually love Maria Corina Machado because they felt she's so radical uh, uh, that she will divide the opposition, that there will be, you know, the mainstream parties of the Venezuelan opposition will run one candidate, she will run also, and that, that will divide it. But now, everything, everyone is sort of united behind her, except for, and this is the typical strategy that the Chavistas have done, some opposition parties that they actually, the Chavismo supports. You know, they create their own opposition, right? Sort of fake opposition. Um, and so, what is the ideal outcome for Maduro? His ideal outcome is have elections, in which he wins using all this money that he's going, he's going to get from this. Uh, to, to give you an, an idea, my expectation is that he will have an increase of at least five to six billion dollars in additional revenues, and he, the economy can grow next year about 10 percent. So that, that is going to be uh, lift him a little bit. He's now in the very bad numbers of about 20 percent support. They are much more able to mobilize their voters than the opposition. So usually he he, get, he has like a. Uh, um, floor of about 30, about a third of the, of the vote. But today, every single poll shows that Maria Corina Machado wins to him by double digits, even in a scenarios in which a lot of the population don't, don't even go to vote. No? And this is, this is important to understand. After 7 million of the most opposition people in Venezuela left the country, and still he loses, right? So the guy is not, is not in great shape. But his idea is, let me try to divide the opposition, uh, to not allow probably Maria Corina Machado, I think it's very unlikely that he will allow her to run, but maybe let someone run that the, some people in the opposition might consider uh, an acceptable candidate and I can win because I divide them and I control all media, uh, you know, I, I spend money like crazy. That's his best, that's his plan A, in my opinion. His plan B is, if that doesn't work, I will not risk power, and I will become like Nicaragua, a country in which, you know, basically what did the president of Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega, do? He, he put in prison every single opposition candidate. That's a good way to win an election, right? <laughs> uh, uh, and so um, that's the, the conundrum that the Venezuelan opposition faced today, because the only leverage is the US. The opposition has very limited leverage capacity today to force anything upon the government. The only thing is this carrot. And so, unfortunately, I think a lot of countries in, in Latin America and in Europe are not willing anymore to push hard for free, free and fair elections in Venezuela. They believe that Maduro is going to stay. And so it basically remains almost just solely in the, in the hands of the US and a couple of other countries like you know, Canada and the UK that do want to see some change in, in Venezuela. Okay. Uh, yeah, that explains um, kind of how the West would have to react to it. But um, considering. <clears throat> With all the two years of, uh, under the regime under Chavez and Maduro, um, what have been the roles, the more power, the roles of the powerful nations such as, um, you know, Ru China, Russia, um, Cuba, I mean, and then in their help to support the regime throughout these years? Um, I know eventually they will be competitive, you know, they're competitors as well. But what have they done 
in these recent years to help prop up the regime, to help... Um, yeah. Interestingly, you know, in the beginning, during the Chavez era, that's 1999 to 2012, the main ally of Venezuela was China. China gave Venezuela loans for upwards of $60 billion, the largest, uh, uh, you know, uh, loans to any country on earth uh, uh, China gave to Venezuela. Venezuela did repay some of that with uh, oil uh, sales to China, uh, but as I said, there is still an outstanding debt that is uh, above $14 billion. Uh, and that, I think, is without adding the interest because the Chinese have basically not, not been adding interest uh, lately. Uh, otherwise, it would be much, much higher. Uh, but China stopped uh, giving money to Venezuela when Chavez died. I think they calculated, as many of us miscalculated, <laughs> thought that Maduro was not going to last. But he did last. But the other reason why they didn't give any money is that they realized that the money was disappearing in Venezuela. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, Venezuela got into a debt. Venezuela has today about a debt of about 150 billion dollars. That's like, you know, three times GDP. That there is no country on earth that has that debt over GDP, right? And the Chinese realized that Venezuela was ne never going to be able to repay their loan, so they didn't want to give them any more money. And the only things that they have considered have been investing in the oil sector, but not even that. They have invested very little in the oil sector since 2012. Who came to the rescue? Russia. The, the head of Rothneft, who is a former KGB guy who speaks Spanish fluently because he was involved with the Cubans, uh, Igor Sechin, uh, that is uh, you know, a, a one of those characters that you read in a, in a, in a novel, uh, uh, I don't know if it's a horror uh, uh, book or a spy book, but he, he's a, quite a character. The guy came to Venezuela and convinced Hugo Chavez to give him some of the prime oil fields in the country and <coughs> gas fields, and he claimed that he was going to invest a lot of money in Venezuela, and he gave him some loans to be repaid by oil, which, by, by the way, Venezuela did repay. They didn't pay the Chinese, but they, they did repay the Russians because the, the Russians were very tough in, in pushing for that, and also because remember that I mentioned that for a while Russia controlled the exports of Venezuelan oil, so basically they they repay themselves because they, they, they were in the middle. Uh, but then uh, US uh, the, the sanctioned Russia, first just Rothneth, but eventually a lot of the Russian companies because of the invasion of Ukraine. And so Russia basically is now out of Venezuela. And they left, they are still involved in the oil industry, but very minimally. So who ended up being the, 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 the last help of Venezuela? Iran, very recently. Uh, you know, there is a strategic alliance between Venezuela, China, uh, uh, and Russia. But so far, you know, the only ones who are helping lately are the, the Iranians. But Maduro went recently to China. He was received in a very, like, uh, you know, important way. And the Chinese announced that they had given, I didn't know that this even exists, but uh, China has officially some level of friendships with countries. And you could be a low-level uh, friend of a very uh, high-level. Venezuela is in sort of in the second category of friendship. I don't know if that will mean anything, but you know. But that's the. the I think the U. Uh, China and Russia love to, you know, get, get involved in Venezuela just at least to put poke the U.S. in the eye, you know, saying you mess with us in Ukraine, we mess with you in your back, uh, in your back door. We see a lot of that back and forth going on in various aspects of global politics with them. Um, one more question real quickly when it comes to the other countries. In terms of OPEC and OPEC Plus, uh, when it comes to oil production, um, we know how, how unified do you, do you expect them to be um, when it comes to Russia to remain to their agreed production, um, their quotas, their agreed production quotas, um, with, obviously with while Maduro and Putin are considered allies in, many sen in some senses here. Um, Venezuela and the original five OPEC countries, um, they, since they're such large competitors, how do you... Um, seeing it play out when it comes to market share at the end of this, or at the end of this. Yeah, well, you know, the, the thing is that Venezuela, uh, the, the, I think the last time that Venezuela had a quota, it was upwards of 2 million barrels. And Venezuela is producing 750,000 barrels today. So we are very far from uh, getting in any trouble with, uh, uh, we, I mean, as a Venezuelan. Of course, uh, it's Maduro down there. But Venezuela is, is very far from getting into that, that, the level in which the OPEC will sort of push them to. So I think that OPEC will give them a lot of rope before, um, you know, b before they start, th they try to enforce any kind of, of quota uh, for a while, because Venezuela is so low from their historical. Of course, if at the same time, you know, Iran enters 
fully into uh, production in Venezuela, it, it, that might make the Saudis a little bit more like uh, wanting to not allow, uh, you know, as fast. But Venezuela is going to be slow. So I, I don't think that will be a restriction for Venezuela. Okay. Well, a couple of questions now internally on Venezuela. Um, I have a question here, uh, two questions here, one from Jose and one from Carlos. Um, first off, how can we be certain about the daily oil production? Um, we all, all we know that is uh, PDVSA will, will tell us the numbers. Um, they could maybe inflate the numbers if need be. How certain do we have? Do we have certain um, watchdogs that can give us more of a better sense of the numbers, of the truth that comes out from the country? Yeah, well, you know, we have a lot of uh, the independent sort of uh, companies uh, try to make an evaluation of how much Venezuela produces. And for example, OPEC produces two numbers, one given by PDVSA, the other one uh, given by sec what they call secondary sources, which are, you know, S&P, uh, uh, Argos, and other uh, uh, firms. Uh, the, uh, the International Energy Agency and the uh, Energy Information Administration also publish estimates. I think we have a relatively good sense of how much oil comes out of Venezuela because tanker tracking has become a very perfected science these days. Um, I think we have less uh, a perfect knowledge about actual uh, productions, and that's why you see some differences between the different sources. But I think in the ballpark, they are pretty much, uh, 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 you know, close to, to, the, to the real uh, levels of production. Occasionally, I get filtered some information, some inside information from PDVSA, and we try to you know, evaluate how this matches up with other uh, data, and typically we come to a conclusion that is close to the production that secondary sources uh, provide to OPEC. Thank you for that. Um, and Jose mentions about, about the power sector. How can you, can you comment on the power sector state as it seems very weak and any potential growth in the oil industry will need electricity and this could be a long-term constraint. Yeah, that, that's a big issue. I'm not an expert on, on power, but Venezuela is facing a tremendous problems with, with power, particularly with uh, transmission and you know the infrastructure is in terrible shape. And that has, even today, even though we are, the countries, the, the economy has, you know, Co uh, contracted so much that you, the demand for electricity has also contracted dramatically, and seven million people have left the country. But even in those, and the industries, you know, stopped. I mean, to give you a, an idea, the, the steel industry in Venezuela is not producing anything. It used to be one of the, the important steel manufacturers in, in Latin America. So, um, so any economic growth or, or recovery of the oil industry will put to test again this terrible uh, 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 sort of situation in the el electricity uh, sector. I think a lot of the companies that are going to invest down there will have to uh, themselves provide, you know, for, for electricity for their uh, own fields to, to have reliable electricity because uh, power is, is, is going to be always a, a, a difficulty down there for, for, for at least a while until significant investments are made. Okay. Venezuelans don't pay for electricity, which is another problem. I mean, so, you know, you cannot invest. Okay, a couple of questions here from Eric. Um, we know Chevron had their, uh, their concessions to come in, but can you comment on Chevron's purchase of Hess into Guyana, given the potential border issue uh, with the historical claim? Is that something you're familiar with? And second, can you please comment on the possible monetization of gas from Venezuela to uh, Trinidad and Tobago? Yeah, the, the two very interesting questions. The, the, this is a very interesting and neat recent development, right? Uh, Chevron bought Hess. Hess is a partner of Exxon in Guyana. You know, they are going to produce uh, uh, in the next few years about a million barrels of oil in, in Guyana. So Guyana might end up producing more oil than Venezuela if Venezuela doesn't get its act together, which is astonishing, you know, coming from zero in, in, in a few years back. Uh, but Venezuela has a big dispute, territorial dispute with, with Guyana. Uh, and Venezuela claims 75% of Guyana's territory. Uh, what, what, what Guyana says is their territory. I, cannot, I, I will not want to get in, uh, into the fight here uh, as, as a Venezuelan. I occasionally receive very nasty comments in my tweet feed when I publish any map that doesn't include on, on the Venezuelan side three-fourths of, of Guyana. No? <laughs> so, so bottom line, this is a very touchy issue for, for people in both countries, but of course for the Guyanese even more. But notice that even though Guyana has offered blocks of, to explore for oil that go into the uh, disputed waters, because this is all offshore, it, it Exxon, and now Chevron, because it's their partner, has never drilled in the disputed area. They, they have found 
more than like 11 billion barrels of, of, of reserves in the, in the area that is clearly within the Guyana side. Of course, the blocks do extend to the disputed waters and the fields might end up you know, being also. So this is a big potential uh, conflict. And it, this is the first time that a company is on both sides because the Chinese are also on the Guyana uh, uh, project, but this is the CNOC, it's not CNPC. So it's a different company, but Chevron will be, and so they will have to, to tread carefully there not to get into, into trouble uh, with uh, you know, either of the, of the, two, uh, of the two sides. Uh, I, you know, I am concerned that because Maduro wants to create some type of commotion for the electoral year, he is now uh, uh, convoked a referendum for December in which Venezuela claims that they will make the Esequibo region, which is the claim territory, into a Venezuelan state, so which will be a very aggressive, you know, it was ba basically annexing a terri the territory, at least uh, uh, from a formal uh, point of view. I think that he's trying to get to the, this, you know, authoritarian regimes usually use this card of, you know, rallying the country around the flag uh, uh, and finding an external enemy, and Maduro is trying to play that card. I think that's a very dangerous situation. Considering that, um, when it comes to the U.S., I have a question here. Oh, I, I forgot to talk about gas. Let me, oh, okay. I know that we are running out of time, but uh, ga gas is a very interesting situation. You know, be be Venezuela, <coughs> discovered gas you know, more than three decades ago in the offshore close to Trinidad. The Trinidadians uh, that discovered around the same time have taken almost all their gas out and their production is declining and Venezuela hasn't taken the first molecule of the offshore uh, gas because it was always uh, uh, you know, a business that the national company didn't um, uh, consider a priority because you know, oil was much more profitable. And as was mentioned, uh, Venezuela is flaring and venting uh, like crazy. It's the second uh, largest uh, venter per barrel, uh, per barrel fall equivalent on Earth uh, uh, behind Turkmenistan. So, so uh, Venezuela has a lot of associated gas on shore and this very attractive potential uh, offshore, not only next to Trinidad, but on the other side of the country in the ENI Repsol project uh, closer to the Colombian side. So, uh, recently, Shell, had, which had been studying this project for, you know, I think more than a decade, uh, but couldn't do it because of sanctions, etc. Uh, Shell and Trinidad, or actually Trinidad, asked for a license for the U.S. government to negotiate with Maduro, because the the Venezuelan uh, gas field is very close to a platform, uh, the Ibiscus platform uh, that Shell has on the Trinidadian side. So you ha can connect with a relatively not, a, not, not, not that big of an investment, those, uh, those two projects, and then you can get to the LNG train of Trinidad that has a lot of spare capacity and export to Europe. That has become, that's not that attractive for, for Maduro from a revenue point of view, but it has become a big deal because the Europeans are desperate for gas. And so Europe has been pressing the US to help get the Venezuelan gas to Europe. And so the first uh, order of business is this project called Dragon, which the U.S. has green-lighted for Trinidad and, and Shell to, to do. Uh, it will take a while, you know, at least two years after everything uh, starts to get that gas ongoing, but, but eventually it could lead to 300 uh, to 350 uh, 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 million cubic feet of gas going to, to Europe. And then the claim is that maybe they can collect the gas-associated gas. The Europeans are offering, dangling another carrot to Maduro is a $1.5 billion loan to collect that gas and take it to Trinidad. I think that's unlikely to happen, but you know. And then you have ENI and Repsol on the other side also claiming that they might uh, do a, 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 a floating LNG to export the gas. I think that's also hard to do because it's a big investment and conditions you know, in Venezuela are problematic. But you know, all, all of these options are currently in this, under discussion. So well, we're, we're almost done here, so if you'd mind just signing us off with um, kind of understanding with the conditions of the Maduro government, um, the U.S.'s views, teetering on sanctions, no sanctions, um, what is something that we can be left with uh, as U.S. citizens on uh, understanding of um, Venezuela's future and their future outlook within the U.S. context? So, you know, the Venezuela used to be a very strong ally of the U.S. and a very important supplier, reliable supplier of oil to the U.S., of course. Since those di days, the U.S. has become a net exporter of oil, and, and it's uh, much less uh, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, interested in, 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 in the production of other countries. But, you know, because this is a global economy still, you know, the, the U.S. cares about the health of the global economy and Venezuela. It's, it's important that Venezuela uh, is a reliable supplier to the world, uh, not necessarily, you know, of course, also some to the U.S. But, of course, the political situation in Venezuela, uh, it's hard, very hard to solve. Uh, it could be a, an amazing opportunity for U.S. companies and companies in Houston if Venezuela opens up because, remember, Venezuela has perhaps not the largest reserves in the world as, as Venezuela claims because those are not, not been, have not been audited and the recovery rates in Venezuela are not the ones that they use to claim those figures. But no doubt that Venezuela has more oil, particularly the extra heavy kind, than we will ever get out <laughs> of, the, of, of, of the subsoil uh, given the energy transition happening. So. This is a great opportunity uh, in terms of business-wise for, 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 for Houston. But of course, from the perspective of the region, it's really important that Venezuela becomes, again, a democratic country. And that's going to be hard to, to get uh, uh, align all these things uh, uh, together. Uh, one important last comment is that remember that the electoral cycle is also here in the US, right? And so if, uh, for example, Donald Trump becomes president, it, Donald Trump had a very aggressive policy against Maduro, but that policy was uh, led and, and conceived by um, Bolton. And, and Bolton, of course, is not anymore a friend of Donald Trump, as we, <laughs> as we have realized recently. So it's not clear what Trump will do in a new administration in terms of, of Venezuela. It is more easy to predict what a second Biden administration might do, which is sort of a continuation of these sort of carrots and and sticks policy to try to get some. Uh, and I forgot to mention, one of the main considerations in the electoral year in the US about Venezuela doesn't have anything to do with the price of gasoline or democracy in Venezuela, or even the Venezuelan community in South Florida that works with the Cuban community and has you know, impact on Florida politics. It is the fact that Venezuelans are crossing the border uh, the, uh, with Mexico in numbers that uh, exceeded every other nation in the last, uh, in, during this year. Uh, so unfortunately, that means that Maduro has a, a, a strong arm, uh, uh, you know, element, which is if uh, the U.S. doesn't have relations with him, he will not allow the deportation of Venezuelans that Im immigrate illegally to the, to the U.S. And he has recently allowed that, and the, that has dramatically reduced the flow of people north because, of course, people are very scared to get back into Venezuela, so they have... Uh, they, they have been crossing in much uh, smaller numbers in, for the last two weeks. So Maduro knows this, and Fidel Castro knew that uh, in Cuba, and, and that's a tremendous tool for him to, to pressure the U.S. Uh, in case uh, you know, the, the relationship uh, gets sour. Uh, again, remember, the U.S. doesn't recognize Maduro as president still today. They negotiate with him, but it's a, I mean, sort of a non-official <laughs> relation. It's a pretty weird situation. Venezuela, the U.S. government recognizes the Venezuelan opposition control national assembly that is not there anymore as the legitimate government of Venezuela, even though the, the interim president uh, is not anymore there. So well, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Uh, Francisco Manaldi, everyone.